my name is William Corliss and this is the Workplace Podcast. Brought to you in association with Yellowwood, providers of executive coaching, corporate training and facilitation. Your external learning and development partner. Each week we focus on a different aspect of the workplace. We hear from guest speakers who will be subject matter experts, who I believe are incredibly talented at what they do. These experts will give you a different perspective and insight to work life, with the aim of empowering you to take a different path to success in all aspects of work life. These perspectives will include career and personal success, leadership, high performance teams, and creating a better work life culture in your organization. Yellowwood, take a different path to success with your career, team, and organization. Welcome to the Workplace Podcast. Our guest today is Michael D. Lang. For over 40 years, Michael has mediated family, workplace and organizational disputes. He has designed and presented introductory and advanced mediation and conflict management courses, workshops and webinars in the US and internationally. Michael created one of the first graduate programs in conflict resolution in the U.S. at Antioch University in 1992 and served in a similar role at Royal Roads University in Victoria. For six years, he was editor-in-chief of the Mediation Quarterly, now Conflict Resolution Quarterly. He serves as an editorial board member and special advisor to the Journal of Mediation and Applied Conflict Management, NUI Minute, my old alma mater. He has authored the Practitioner's Guide to Reflective Practice in Conflict Resolution, 2019, and co-authored The Making of a Mediator, Developing Artistry and Practice in the year 2000. He is the co-creator and co-editor with his Irish colleague, Peter Nicholson, of Living Together, Separating, Divorcing, Surviving During a Pandemic, and that was released uh, in 2020, and a new book, Family Conflict During a Pandemic, Stories of Struggle and Hope 2021. Michael also has created a video series in their voices, which will be available in the links in this podcast. And Michael currently facilitates eight monthly online reflective practice groups for mediators, including a group of Irish mediators. Michael, welcome to the Workplace Podcast. (laughs) Thank you very much, William. Thank you. It is an immense privilege that you're on the podcast here. And I want to tap into decades of experience here that you have when it comes to mastery, when it comes to reflective practice. So if that's okay with you, let's let's dip into mastery. So what are the key elements when it comes to developing mastery in mediation? Well, <clears throat> you may, um, in, in the book, uh, The Guide to Reflective Practice, I list nine. I'm not going to list them all. Yeah. Um, I call them attributes of um, of reflective practitioner. Um, the idea behind those those nine really began when I wrote uh, co-wrote the first book, uh, mm-hmm. The Making of a Mediator. We had six what we called hallmarks yeah. of um, of excellence in practice. And over the over the intervening two decades, it occurred to me that there were more. And so let me just take a a few of them uh, to highlight. Um, The first and the most critical uh, for me is curiosity. Uh, You know, we as as mediators um, are brought into other people's lives, Um, whether it despite, I mean, no matter what type of conflict situation we're talking, if it's a workplace situation, we're brought into their lives not so much their personal life, but certainly their workplace life. Um, We get to know a little bit about them. And, um, and in every dispute that that really happens. Well, that the challenge is that we is to be broadly focused on the kinds of things that we want to inquire about. Uh, Usually, um, people, uh, mediators, limit themselves to what I do call just inquiry. And that is, you know, what are the facts? What happened? How long has it gone on? What is the impact? And what do you want to do about it? And for me, I want to be a little bit more curious. I want to be a little bit more open and interested in who the people are 
and to learn more about the origins, the nature of the conflict and its and its impact. So I think about curiosity as the absolute fundamental. And I think of it in this way. It is um, like being a six year old again and having the unrestrained ability to ask questions, even if they might border on being impertinent. It's OK, uh, as long as they're not rude and disrespectful um, and just endlessly asking questions, thinking about why. I mean, we can either if we have children or in my case, not only children, but grandchildren and um, or if we can remember back to when we were young and we were just voracious learners. We were omnivores. You know, we were we wanted to know about anything. We wanted to touch it, smell it, taste it. Um, we wanted to ask about it. And I think that that is one of the characteristics that separates out the really extraordinary mediators from those who are competent, effective, who do good work, but whom I would might give a B or a B plus to. And we're talking about how to move to uh, an A, to a, a better grade. And I think that the curiosity is the first key. And I'll stop there in case you have questions. This episode was brought to you in association with the Mediation Foundation of Ireland, Europe's premier provider of mediation certification and training. For more information, check out mfi.ie. I, I completely <clears throat> agree because we had a conversation just before we started recording about our different areas of interest and that lifelong learning. I would completely agree with you that curiosity piece, I think, is essential to that mastery. And I would like to invite you in. What are the other elements then that you would say are, are hallmarks? So another um, uh, important attribute is, um, is our appreciation for, we talk often in our field about about mediators having a tolerance for ambiguity, mm. uh, meaning that we can be in the middle of situations that are awkward, confusing, unsettling, and, um, and have a presence there. I go a step further, and I think about it as um, uh, engaging with that awkwardness, not just tolerating it, not simply being um, uh, able to be in the presence of discord, but rather recognizing that the ambiguity, the discord, the confusion, uh, the feeling of being unsettled is really a key to being able to understand the parties and their disputes. So I am prepared to dive into the ambiguity, not just simply accept it. So I think that's another um, uh, really uh, an important attribute. I'm glad you said that, that tolerance of ambiguity. And when I'm training people to meet, be mediators and my own learnings as well, it, it, and you talk about building on the curiosity, the work of a mediator is actually going into that ambiguity. And a lot of people go, well, why won't I get comfortable at being a mediator? And I think the question is, mediation is not comfortable. It's about being comfortable being uncomfortable, you know, would you share kind of similar thoughts on that? Well, exactly. I think we learn how to be comfortable in our own skin. Mm. That's the comfort. Uh, the discomfort is what's taking place outside. So we have to be, we have to be solid. We have to have a sense of stability um, because we're helping to create a crucible um, a safe space, an opportunity for people to talk at whatever level of detail, um, however heartfelt they choose to do it. But we need to create that. And the only way we can do it is if we're standing strong and we're confident about, about what we're doing. Uh, so I do think that's, uh, that's important, right? So we, yes, the, the process is uncomfortable for them and it's uncomfortable for us because we don't know anything about these people we really don't i don't care if we've had pre-mediation conversations if we've read briefs in some cases that lawyers might submit it doesn't matter we really don't know them we're getting just 
it's it, we sometimes if we're lucky we get the equivalent of the movie trailer sometimes we only get snapshots we never get the movie because that's their whole life and that's their their the way in which they <clears throat> they experience life they experience work they experience other people um the the whether they're optimists or you know all of the things that make them make each of us you know remarkably unique human beings well we we only have the tiniest understanding of that so there's always going to be confusion for us as we try to sort out for ourselves and as they sort out for themselves what's going on yeah so we've talked about curiosity we talk about that tolerance of ambiguity what other hallmarks would be important for our listeners um to highlight uh, they, these are really companion pieces in a way uh, nurture simplicity and pay attention to detail because what i mean by nurturing simplicity is that sometimes when we get involved um in conversations with parties um we can get we can have this extraordinarily large view and imagine that this is a very grand and and um and challenging situation and it's true that these are i don't care how major or minor the conflict is i don't care what how much money it's about or anything else it's always vitally important to the parties but we can make too much of it we can start to see things that and what we need to do is pay attention to um to reduce it to what is the simplest the most critical pieces for the parties and um and that's part of where the curiosity comes in which is how do i how do i know what's really at stake for somebody and my curiosity is a way of doing that and it helps me um narrow things down uh, now i don't artificially narrow something down i pay attention to all of the little details as well to make sure that as i'm trying to be simple and not overly complicate things i'm also not ignoring important details that are really critical uh, i'll give you an example about about uh, detail um a uh, it's actually came up uh, while i was doing a um a mediation training course and uh we're observing a role play it's mediation um a supervisor and supervisee um having a dispute uh they seem to have resolved the dispute and the mediator was then going over the uh their agreement saying so you've agreed to this and so and so, and so on. turns to uh the supervisor and the supervisor says um uh yeah and turns to the uh supervisee who says oh yeah that's that's exactly right and the mediator thought oh that was not a glowing endorsement of this agreement that was a sort of a grudging so the mediator uh decided before doing anything else he separated the parties and in talking with the supervisor the supervisor said yeah all of that stuff is fine i 100% agree it's good i hope it will work i'm not confident but i'm i'm prepared to give it 100%. The real problem is he wants my job. Yeah. So then the mediator goes and talks to the supervisee and raises this question in a delicate way. Mm. And the supervisee says, "I don't want his job. I want his boss's job. He's a great guy. He does really well." He said, "I'm looking to advance." but i don't want to undermine him in order to do it i want him to succeed at whatever level he can and i do too they brought the mediator brings them back together again and they basically say okay on this new understanding the agreement as we originally reached it absolutely fine that one little detail of observe because it's so easy to overlook that when we're in the excitement of 
you know, parties having reached agreement and we're saying, oh, yes, good. <laughs> this one's done. They're happy. They're going to go away. Yeah. I'm just, I just have to do this perfunctory thing of checking with them about the agreement. And, and lo and behold, paying attention to that little detail made all the difference between having an agreement that might have worked that also might have fallen apart and one that was definitely likely to work. I think that's a really important lesson as well is to, when you were talking about simplify, it really is about sometimes is asking clarifying questions, summarizing um, and distilling down the essence of, of what their interests and needs are, isn't it? It's, it's, Mm -hmm. and it's having that presence of mind to notice a bit like what was going on there, the body language is said, listen, it wasn't really an overwhelming yes to the agreement. And right. I, I think that's where mastery is, is that you're, you're, you're not just paying attention to the details uh, that's written in agreement. It's the actual details of what the dynamics in the room, the body language, maybe what's the unsaid. I think what you're tapping into there, would it be correct in right. that? That's right. And being willing to ask um, about it. I mean, this mm. is part of where the curiosity, just to say, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm uh, off base here, but let me just ask you, uh, when I read through the agreement, you said, okay, but I sensed some hesitation or you weren't terribly enthusiastic. Is that just me or is there something there? Oh, you know, well, now you learn. On the other hand, the person can push back and not push back, but say, nah, look, I'm just tired. The agreement's fine. Let's keep going. Good. I've asked my question. The person responded and we move ahead. And it's that confidence in your competence then as well that allows you to take that risk in an uncomfortable situation. Right. And that's you know, when when you said that this, your students, your trainees say, when am I ever when is this ever going to be comfortable? And you say it's never going to be comfortable. Well, no, conflict isn't comfortable. But we can be just as you just said, William, we can be confident in enough in our abilities to be able to engage with them in a way in which they need us to. And. Myself and, and, and uh, my partner, Luke, in the MFI, when we're teaching people then about mastery, we say, listen, a lot of it is down to, you know, reflective practice, reflecting and say, listen, what is it I did well? Or what is it I need to improve next time? And with that, uh, with that in mind, like what are the key elements when it comes to reflective practice then? Uh, and why is it important then for, I suppose, newly qualified mediators then to I suppose, practice uh, mediation. So we'll go with the newly qualified uh, mediators there. Why is reflective practice so important? Yeah, I'll just say, and I hope we come to the to the more experienced because reflective practice is really, it, it's a, you know, one of the other attributes of, um, of uh, mastery or excellence in practice is a commitment to lifelong learning. Yeah. You know, that, that you don't say, oh, I got this. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. Um, you know, my settlement rate is 93%. Um, I'm getting enough referrals. I must be really good. And that's, and then, and then you end up digging yourself a rut um, and mistaking it for a groove. <laughs> so, um, uh, so um, the important thing is, is um, in terms of reflective practice, it is an opportunity to really learn from our experience. And a lot of, of what people do um, by way of learning is it, it's, it's helpful. Um, I don't want to dismiss it or, or downplay it. Um, but for example, I have seen um, uh, mediation organizations that have checklists for their mediators. Uh, did you do the opening? Um, did you talk about confidentiality? Did you do this? Did you explore interests? Did you, did you, did you brainstorm? Did you, you know, um, and, you know, though that's okay um, as a reminder to, especially to a beginning mediator, 
that there are these multiple elements that are part of every mediation. But what happens is if that's all that's done, the mediator um, just learns how to um, how to make a recipe. You know, um, so many mills of this, so many mills of that. And uh, and poof, you got a cake <laughs> <You know? laughs> or my favorite soda bread. Um, uh, but that's not what mediation is. And yet that checklist can be a useful thing. The other thing is that that sometimes happens and uh, and, and mediators pick this up early on is the question of what did you do well and what do you think you could improve on? Well, those aren't per se, you know, I don't have a problem per se with those questions. What I have a problem with is this. Um, if you ask um, a newbie mediator those questions, how in the world is she going to have the knowledge and experience to be able to answer them? It's an impossibility. And, and, even, and I don't even think those are the best questions to ask anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even for more experienced mediators. Mm. Um, and, um, and another way in which people um, often learn is they ask colleagues, what do you think I should do in this situation? And, um, and, and my view is, uh, how should I know? Um, I'm not you. I don't think the way you do. I don't live in your skin. I don't see things the way you see them. I don't interpret them. We could look at exactly the same situation and I would have come away with a different interpretation from you. Um, that's just, that's not good. It just is. It isn't right or wrong, good or bad. So, and I wasn't there. <laughs> I didn't have, I didn't hear the people's voices. I didn't see them. Um, if it were live, you know, I mean, if we were, if we were face to face, I, you know, I didn't get the measure of somebody. Um, I didn't get, for example, if you were a party in a mediation, I get to see the background behind you, the bookcase and the items on the bookcase. And um, I, I can either ask about that or it just gives me a sense about it. Well, so asking me for my advice it's going to be very limited um, if, if effective at all. Yeah. So what reflective practice is, is the opportunity to take our experiences and examine them from the point of view of this occurred. I was curious about what happened. It was surprising. It was maybe awkward. Uh, maybe at worst frustrating. Um, surprising. Um, but those moments were called to my attention. And now I have to ask myself, what is it about that experience that was surprising to me or, or, or unsettling in some way? What was happening prior to that? What was I doing? How do I explain that what took place was unexpected? How do I do that? Because if I can understand how that occurred, it helps me learn better about how people, in, how I interact with people and how they interact with one another. I get to, you know, we all have these scripts in a way or patterns of, um, of the way in which we interact with, uh, with parties. And when I ask these kinds of questions and I reflect on my experience, what I'm doing is adding nuance and depth to those patterns. In some cases, I may jettison the pattern altogether and say, oh, that really um, wasn't, uh, that's not something I ever want to do again. Not just because it didn't work, but because I understand why it didn't work. I'll give you a very quick um, example out of my own experience. So I I'd been doing divorce mediation for, I don't know, half a dozen years, perhaps. Yeah. And back in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, that 
that probably meant two years worth of work. <laughs> you know, it, it, it just wasn't a lot. And I lived in a in a in an area um, uh, in in the state of Maine. Uh, so the population of a million for the entire state, and uh, and my area had maybe anyway there there weren't a lot there wasn't and people weren't aware of what mediation was. Yeah. So I had sort of developed this um, this pattern in terms of which do we talk what do we talk about first? And I would say to parties, you know, you can talk about whatever you want to. You can about this, 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 but personal possessions. I said. Very often we just leave to the end because those tend to be much less contentious. So what else do you want to talk about? And the the two, <laughs> the husband and wife looked at one another and they almost laughed. They were grinning and they had these sort of Cheshire cat grins on their faces. And um, one of them, I forgot which, the wife or the husband, reached into their briefcase and pulled out a 16-page single-spaced list of all their possessions. Wow! They were um, they were experts. Uh, one of them was a museum curator, <laughs> and so they would go to flea markets and they would find these treasures. You know, something that would be worth a thousand dollars that they would that they would pay twenty five dollars for because nobody really understood, but they understood the value. So it wasn't simply the financial value. It was that these, they had acquired all of these items and each item had a story to it. It wasn't just an acquisition. It was a piece of their life. And so <clears throat> everything else in the mediation took <laughs> very little time and going through the 16 page list. So I learned never, to say that, but in fact, to just ask open questions and to say, what's most important to you? What do you think would be most helpful to start with? What do you think are the list of items as you've thought about coming and sitting and talking with me? Yeah, so I, in that case, I jettisoned that pattern yeah. entirely in recognition, but I learned why. I didn't just yeah. say, oh, well, that didn't work. I'll never try it again. It wasn't mm. simply trial and error. I thought about what was it about my interaction that created a situation that was unsettling? This episode was brought to you in association with the Mediation Foundation of Ireland, Europe's premier provider of mediation certification and training. For more information, check out mfi.ie. So if we're in a, a reflective practice group with you, then how do I know I'm in a really good one? You know, because the, the people will be, you know, attracted to these ones that say, listen, OK, I'm listening to, to Michael now uh, and I need to find my own reflective practice. Group. How, do, how would I what are the key things I know if I was to sit into a meeting that I know that uh, best practice has been a dear well, Um One of the things is um, there, there are two broad sorts of groups, mm. one um, self-run and the other facilitated. Um, and in, e in each instance, um, I think it's really important that people have a common understanding of what reflective practice is. This isn't like reading from the Bible, you know, and that, that it, we all have to have exactly the same view, but we have to have a framework that's similar enough so that, for example, um, in order to build a trusting relationship so that I could talk about something like the example I just gave, um, which was embarrassing to me. And, uh, and yet I wanted to learn something about it because I didn't want to go through that experience again. It wasn't helpful to me and it wasn't helpful to the parties. So I, I want to be in a group where I feel as though I'm treated with respect. I'm, my, anything I say is treated confidentially. Essentially, I want to build a measure of trust. So that's one thing. Secondly, a common understanding. Um, one of the key things is that in, in our reflective practice groups, the groups that I've either helped start or that I facilitate, we don't offer opinions. We don't offer advice. We don't offer recommendations. 
we don't. It's it can be difficult at times for the mediator who's presenting a problem to say, "Well, just tell me, damn it, you know, I need yeah. to know the answer to this." And and the response is, "Let's explore it, and you'll find the answer." Because the belief is the fundamental belief is that self exploration leads to self discovery, and that discovery, if it comes on your own, is going to be richer and more relevant and more durable than anything I tell you by way of an opinion. Um, so those are the key elements really to um, any reflective practice group. And and if any of your listeners are interested, I, you'll probably, as part of the post, indicate my email address. And any of them can write to me for information. I've got materials for how to develop and start a reflective practice group. Um, I'm always looking to help uh, other people do it. Occasionally, I will, um, if I've got the time, I'll even offer to facilitate a few meetings to get the group started um, so they get a feel for it and, and, uh, and, and, and develop their own confidence in their ability to be able to manage the group. I really appreciate that offer. Thank you so much, Michael. And if I may, since we're on the topic about reflective practice and that exploring piece, because you're a pioneer in this for for many decades, what are your thoughts on the role of supervision in enhancing, you know, your uh, maintaining uh, mastery in mediation? You know, supervision has um, that that word can imply a number of things. So let me just, um, if you don't mind, I just yeah. break it down in the way I think about it. Because yeah. <clears throat> sometimes when people talk about supervision, what they're talking about is information, you know, giving information or doing training yeah. so that somebody clearly missed something in their yeah. training or they're deficient in a particular skill and or knowledge they um uh you know they may not for example know how they may not be comfortable with the process of moving people into a caucus and then moving them back out and so instruction to help them do that which is different from the choice of whether to be in a caucus or not that's a very different question um, so there's information and, and training is one part of it. Evaluation can be another piece, um, which is altogether different, where you really are assessing somebody who is part of um, of an ongoing program, who may be a an employee, or you may be the manager of a group and they're a volunteer or a, or um, or paid staff. I did some work with uh, Family Mediation Service. And this was one of the one of the questions that we had is to be able to distinguish evaluation um, and that level of feedback to say, you know, you're you're not keeping up with your with your paperwork. You're not doing the paperwork correctly. You're da, 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 you know, these guys and you are doing this really well. That's that, you know, in the nature of evaluation. That's also valuable and important. But what I would what I would say is that the other part of supervision is when somebody is is to create a relationship in which the other person can come to you as the supervisor and say, I struggled with this or something remarkable happened. It was really positive and I was completely surprised by it. I had never saw it coming and uh and i was stopped in my tracks for a moment i was flummoxed i didn't know what to do because that was something you know these folks who had been bitterly arguing suddenly turned to one another and said enough let's just get this settled i was like what happened there you know how did that occur um so the so in that nature of supervision, that's where I reflective practice can be hugely important yeah. because 
then I'm helping that person make sense of an experience for themselves. Um, I was thinking of if I can give you an example without breaching confidentiality from uh, how I can um, maneuver the facts. But in fact, one of the one of the uh, a recent situation involved the use of private sessions, and the mediator um, was um, was struggling with whether he had done this in a way that um, that was particularly useful. I mean, he knew how to separate, explain, talk about confidentiality, and then bring people back together again. But what he was really questioning is whether this was the right timing, whether whether this was because I was unsettled, did I do it for my own reasons, or did I do it because it was helpful to the parties? Um, not that either one of those is wrong. It's just being really clear about why you're doing it. And so the conversation was, Talk about what you were experiencing, what was what was happening in the moment, um, what when you thought about convening uh, a private meeting, what went through your mind. You know, we a lot of times we ask the question, when X was happening, what were you thinking? When you chose to do X, what was going on? Never ask the question, why did you do X? Because that immediately puts the person on the defensive. Yeah. They have to, they're going to protect themselves. And I, I don't want that. I want them to be able to explore their own thinking. Because uh, maybe it's the thinking was faulty. Maybe they misread some, whatever it might be. Your book is a tremendous resource in, in that manner. And you talk about the different types of reflective practice. And, and one thing that an analogy used with purposeful learning is like a bit like a mechanic. Do you keep using a different tool until you get it right? Or do you use the right tool at the right time for the right purpose? And I think that's one of my biggest uh, takeaways uh, when it comes to the importance of reflective practice. And if it's okay, if I may, to ask you about the different types of, uh, of reflective practice then for people so they know you know, that it's a, there's a bit more depth to this and they can tap into actually the resource of the book that you had. So can you tell me a little bit about that? One of the things that I think is really important is that we set ourselves up at the beginning hmm. to um, uh, so that we are, when we engage in the mediation, we are already in a mindset to be um, attentive to what's happening and to be to be noticing things about the process and about ourselves that we can, from which we can learn. We're not just doing the work. That's important. The doing of it carefully, respectfully, all of that's important. But being, thinking about how I'm making these choices, um, which, so I, I have, created a, a, a questionnaire, really, an instrument that, that helps people think in advance, um, sort of help them frame themselves so that they can, they can be attentive to those moments where they can learn something. Um, there's the opportunity to learn. You know, when something um, is surprising um, or awkward, um, we shouldn't just push through it. We need to take the time and say, well, that's really curious. I wonder why that happened. Um, and sometimes that reflection can, can take a matter of seconds. Um, sometimes it's more complicated um, for whatever reason. Um, and um, I have in those moments when I've been um, stumped and need some time, I will either say, to the parties, I just need a minute. You know, what just happened here was um, I feel a little awkward about, and I just want to think about how best to help you. So just if you don't mind being quiet for a minute, give me a minute. Um, if it's a bigger issue, um, and if the timing seems right, I'll say, um, how about a cup of tea? Yeah. Could we all use, or how about a, uh, 
a bathroom break. And I use that as my time to think if I need to. I don't, I'm very open with the parties um, in that respect that I will say, I'm stumped right now and I need to take some time to think. Uh, and I uh, hope you don't mind, but that's just, it'll take me a minute or so and we'll get right back to it. I think that um, they appreciate that. They they don't feel as though I'm incompetent, rather that I am being very purposeful in the way in which I want to help them. Um, and I set it up in advance. You know, yeah. I tell them, for example, look, as we go through this, this is we're doing this together. Um, we each have our own role. And um, you're welcome to ask me any question about what I'm doing at any time, and I will answer it. I'll tell you why I asked a particular question or why I did this or why I did that, because this is for your benefit, and I don't keep secrets. Um, so that sets it up. So, it, you know, if I do say, you really yeah. got me on that one, I didn't see that coming. Um, they, 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 it, it's part of the flow. Uh, it doesn't seem unnatural. And then there's the part afterward, the post-reflection. Yeah. And, and there are a couple of, you know, one is the reflective practice group, which uh, is a marvelous place because the kinds of questions that get asked are um, you've got a group of people who are supporting your learning. And they also can help you um, think about it. They can help you um, not really get outside yourself, but get further into yourself. And um, by, by being curious and by asking their questions. So the, in a reflective practice group, it's a really marvelous opportunity to um, engage with others, but not to ask for their opinion. Because they're not, in my groups, we don't give opinions. Okay. Um, and, uh, and in some, you know, for example, yesterday I, I ran a group and, um, of the eight people in the group, um, we did one, uh, one practice situation for, um, an hour. Uh, some take 10, 15 minutes. This one, it, it took an hour and every single person had a question for the, for the individual, the mediator who was presenting the practice challenge. And he was, he was just, at the end of it, he was so grateful for the variety of questions. You know, we don't do piling on. We don't, um, it, it's not an interrogation. It's done um, because the purpose is to help the person um, not to prove how clever we are with our questions. The other benefit to the groups, and I'm going to get back to the individual reflection in a second. The other benefit is that every single person learns something from what one person does. There's always an insight and awareness that, that comes about. But people can also do their reflection um, on their own. And I have an instrument in the book, a guide, um, that tries to, to help people do that. Um, I'm working with a, another colleague, uh, an Israeli colleague, who has done some wonderful research. And she has developed um, uh, another instrument that we're writing about and are going to be actually presenting on um, a week from today. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 I can pr provide you with that information if you want to. Um, and it's because what she is convinced of is that um, structured reflection is really important. In other words, it's not just sitting back and saying, hmm, let me think about it, and sort of, you know, like a like rerunning a movie, um, yeah. just having the, you know, she thinks that, as I do, that there's a real value in, in structured reflection, a structure that is, um, that's there to provide a nurturing guide, not a, um, not a straitjacket. This episode was brought to you in association with the Mediation Foundation of Ireland. 
Europe's premier provider of mediation certification and training. For more information, check out mfi.ie. So I, there's an instrument like that in the book that helps people um, because just sitting back and thinking, sometimes, you know, if you're really, you know, I can do that, but I've been practicing this for um, over 30 years. Mm. So I know the questions to run through my head. Yeah. Um, for others, um, they need, the, the, there is a value in having those questions to stimulate their thinking. So, um, yeah, and uh, so those are the, the various methods. It's prior to, during, and after um, the, the mediation. I think your, your book is such a tremendous uh, resource, and you have a quote there from Robert Frost, which our listeners may not know, but that's where yellow will come from to take the road not taken right and that's what i encourage people to take a different path and in that book you quote robert frost i am not a teacher i am an awakener and i think it's a bit like that resource of those questions and the structures you have in the book from my reflective practice it's a bit like a stabilizers on a stabilizers on a bike yeah i have them for a while and now i find my own practice through meditation or through mind maps or through journaling and sometimes I need to do that work first before I present it to my sharing and learning group because I need to understand what went on for me and to really fully distill and, you know, um, present it in a way that I actually people can can comment. So I need to synthesize down what my challenge was and what my struggle is. Is that something that you would recommend for people to find a practice or what tips would you give people in their own individual practice? Well, I, I think um, I, I like the idea of um, of the stabilizer. And, uh, you know, that goes back to what we were talking about uh, early on, the sort of the mediator's checklist. You know, did I do the opening statement? Did I do that? All of those are, are important until you <clears throat> feel a sense of confidence. And the same way with the instruments yeah. in the book. Um, they're there to help you get a start on asking yourself the kinds of questions that are likely to produce the learning that is going to make a difference in your practice. Um, so that's, that's really key. Um, many of the people who come to the, uh, the reflective practice groups do what you have, have described, and that is uh, they've thought about a practice situation for a while. And part of the reason they bring it to the group is because even with all of their the time and effort of thinking through things, they're still struggling uh, yeah. with a question that's just puzzling them to such an extent that they can't let go of it. Um, and it can be tiny, can be large. Occasionally, people will come fresh from uh, a mediation. We we uh, I had a group on Monday, and that happened. Um, the person said. So that we were meeting on Monday and uh, she said, this just happened on Friday and, 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 and then went on because it was ripe. It was the group was available um, and she was ready to talk. So uh, it can be both. Yeah. And I, I, I suppose the reason why I'm encouraging our listeners to do reflective practices at the start, I didn't really have it down as a discipline that I did. And it used to stay with me for a couple of days. And this was my way to, I suppose, let it go and make sense of it, to learn from it, to figure out well, what was it that was the challenge uh, there. And speaking yeah, of challenge, yeah, go on. It, yeah. Does, it does. That's right. It does. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, William. But it does allow you, in a way, to let it go. Because, um, you know, if we're celebrating a success, right? The, the bubbly uh, champagne is going to dissipate yeah. after after we've drunk it, yeah. and um, and if we've had a frustrating experience and we've booted ourselves in the rear, um, the pain and the uh, uh, and the black and blue mark might disappear after a few days as well. But the real question is, what do I learn that that I that that stays with me indefinitely? And I think there is a danger there is just because you've had a success that there was no learning in it. 
or where could I improve and what I did well, you know, and that's where I was coming from with my, my speak. <clears throat> that's just how I speak to myself um, there. And with regard to changes in practices, Dennis, if it's okay that I ask you about your experiences during mm-hmm. the pandemic, and I know you've written two book, uh, two books uh, on that about your experiences and also, um, and to, to uh, introduce our, the lovely David Gray, who has, um, has contributed to them. And I know you have another one um, coming up uh, soon. Zoom and online mediation. What are your, what are your biggest learnings there for the last couple of years? You know, Um, the, the most important thing for me is to not let the technology get in the way. Mm. Um, And, and, and I mean it in this way. I mean, some people think of it as, Oh, knowing how to set up the breakout rooms and go ahead. Yes, all of that's really important. But what I mean is when I'm mediating with someone, now now the listeners won't be able to, can't see this, but I can see um, the bookshelf behind you and I can see objects on the bookshelf and I can be curious about some of those. And I might even say if we were doing a mediation, William, I'm really interested. I'm curious. Um, about the items that you have there. There's this yellow cube that's smiley, got a wonderful smiling face. And uh, tell me about that. And the reason that that's important is that it humanizes. Mm. It doesn't let, you know, the impersonality of the technology take away from the humanity of our exchange as, as people. Um, You know, that kind of, um, of relationship um, is, can be lost and we can become more techno, we can become so enamored of the technology that we, um, uh, that we lose that connection with other people. And it, it, the danger is if we do that, then the mediations become um, purely instrumental. They're utilitarian. There's what's the deal? How are we going to get there? And let's do that. And we forget that the deal is made by people. People are making these choices. They're human beings with all of the um, the variety of interests, needs, and so on. You know, the, the colleague I from Israel, I referred to her name as Sofnat Peleg Baker. Um she, her instrument that she's developed is built around this idea. And this is very much applies, it applies even more to this question, um, William, about, about the technology. And that is that, that, that there are four basic needs that people have when they come um, uh, to a mediation. And each of them is complex in their own way and varies from human being to one another uh, and from situation. One is the substance, the content, the settlement, the agreement, the deal, whatever. That's the explicit um, need that people have. Um, we don't we, we don't want to go to court. We want to get this settled. But there are three others. Um, process. Um, People have a need for a process. They have different needs and interests and concerns about process. Um, uh, the third is relationship. Um, uh, not that they are going to have, and you know, if they're a couple who are uh, divorcing or a landlord and tenant who are not going to see each other again, but they still have relationship needs and interests in respect to the mediation. And the last is identity who I see myself as being in relation to the conflict and in relation to the resolution of the conflict. Um, This is not an existential (laughs) sort of exploration of who am I, um, you know, that's, that's done better done in another form. So if we're, if we don't, if we, you, if the technology inhibits us or becomes an additional limitation on exploring the implicit needs then we really are just um, baking cakes. Yeah. You know, we're following a recipe. Uh, We're maybe adjusting 
the ingredients or the amounts here and there, but we're just doing a recipe. And I don't think that serves us, and it certainly doesn't serve the parties we work with. I really appreciate your your uh, insights uh, there. And if it's okay, just to ask you one more question. Sure. If you were a mediator, mediator starting out right now, so a lot of uh, you know um, people might be listening in who are brand new to mediation. What tips would you give them right now to be the best mediators that they can be? Well, the 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 two most the three, um, and these are are uh, among the attributes that I talk about in the book. We've talked a lot about curiosity, so not letting yourself believe that you really know it all, um, uh, being humble, and in that humility. Uh, being very curious about uh, about yourself, but most importantly about the other parties. Secondly, commit yourself to learning on a constant basis. And uh, third, um, uh, let failure be your mentor. Um, I use. Uh, I wish I had. Well, you they can't see it anyway. But um, I have. Uh, um, one of my sons is an artist, and he created a piece that is a um, uh, a quote, a piece of a quote from Samuel Beckett. Um, yeah. And the full quote is, um, ever tried, ever failed, try again, fail again, fail better. I love that quote. I love, and thank you for quoting an Irish uh, poet at that as well. Appreciate it. I didn't, I, I didn't do it. Uh, I mean, uh, he created this piece. It just says fail again. In fact, it's in the book. Okay. Uh, and that image is in the book. Yeah. And yeah. he created it. Um, he calls it his ransom note series um, okay. because he created it out of letters that he cut out of newspapers and magazines that say fail again, uh, fail better. Yeah. And I have it sitting, uh, if I were in my office, it would be on a prominent place on my bookshelf. Um, and it's, it's a constant reminder to me yeah. um, that uh, to, to hold myself accountable mm. um, in a way that says uh, not, and not, not, not to blame myself, but to hold myself accountable for learning from the richness of my experiences and the frustrations of them. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure to tap into your decades of experience. I really appreciate you, your William. time today. This has been absolutely a delight and fun. It's really enjoyable to talk with you. And uh, as, uh, as we said at the, uh, at the outset, um, any limitation that I thought I might place on on uh, our stopping a bit early, it just went right by the wayside uh, and yeah, quite it, easily so. Well, we'd love to have you on the, the podcast again uh, if you're up to it. And, and hopefully we can talk about your, your, your new book that's coming out. Good. Love to do it. Love that. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, William. That's it for this episode of the Workplace Podcast. My special thanks to this week's guest for a wonderful discussion. If you want to get in contact with a podcast about a workplace topic or a particular challenge that you're facing, contact me via Twitter at Different Paths. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn, William Corless, C-O-R-L-E-S-S, or go to my website, www.yellowwood.ie. Yellowwood, your external learning and development partner. Provider executive coaching, facilitation, and training. Take a different path to success with your career, leadership, team, and organization.